Now we've been looking at one of the reasons for the writing of this epistle, namely to prevent sin. To prevent sin. We want to deal with one of the difficult verses in 1 John, one of the most difficult. There are a number of very difficult passages. And here's one, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 16. The penalty for sin. The penalty for sin. If any man see his brother, that's not a blood brother now, this is a family epistle. And the word brother in the term brethren in the plural number refers to all mankind. Uh, for example, uh, the masculine is used frequently throughout the Bible. Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, and so forth. That doesn't exclude the women. It's a generic term used for both sexes. Blessed is mankind. Now this is not a blood brother here, not, not a male, not the male sex. It's a generic term. You're in the family now. And uh, this is a fellowship of the brethren. That does not exclude women. Remember, that term in the Bible is a generic term for both sexes. Now, we read in 1 John 5, 16, If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Now, there are two things about the text that are basic to an understanding of the text. The person in the text sinning is a believer. This is a family letter. It is written to God's dear children. They're called little children throughout 1 John. God's born again ones. This is a family epistle written to believers anywhere and everywhere, a general letter so that the sinning person in this text is a believer. The second basic thought to keep in mind is that the death in this text is the physical death of the body. The physical death of the body. I keep those two thoughts in mind. The person sinning is a believer, a born-again person. And the death referred to in the text is the death of the body. Now, before I go into a further explanation of this, or a, rather a biblical illustration of it, I'm going to ask you to turn to Revelation chapter 20, please. Revelation chapter 20. And when you found Revelation chapter 20, don't lose 1 John, we're going to come back there. When you found Revelation chapter 20, I'm going to read some verses, and I'm going to ask you to make note of a particular phrase and I'm going to emphasize it appears three times. Verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful, meaning the cowardly, and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now three times you find the phrase, the second death. What does this mean? The best way for me to attempt to explain it to you be to make a suggestion to you. Take your ballpoint pen and between the words second and death, you make a carrot. Don't try to draw a vegetable that you eat. A carrot is a V upside down. Just put a little V upside down between the words second and death. And then that means you're going to insert something between those two words. And then the space directly above, you can print in the two words, kind of, kind of. So that this phrase, the second death, means actually the second kind of death. Now that tells us that there is another kind of death. Now before we explain the difference between the two kinds of death, let me explain further 
how this word death can be understood very simply. Every time you find the word death in the Bible, you can replace it with the word separation. That sound difficult? Let me explain. Death is merely a separation. For example, if I were to die in your presence, what would take place would be a separation. The spiritual part of me, the real me, the body is not the real me. The body is merely the shell or the case that carries me about. But the real me would separate from the body. That's dead. Philippians chapter 1, I would depart to be with Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I would be absent from my body and present with my Lord. Separation, that's all death is. Now that's one kind of death, physical death. Separation of the real you from the body. Now for a believer to die having lived your full life in the will of God, to die is far better, Philippians 1. To be absent from the body and present with the Lord is far, far better. So that kind of a separation is not to be feared. I do not fear that kind of death. I am cowardly, and I'm big enough coward, not to want to linger a long, painful slow, agonizing, suffering death. That, I shrink from that. I have to be honest with you. I don't want that. But to die, no problem. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Separation. That's one kind of death, physical death. Now, the second kind of death, explained in Revelation chapters 20 and 21, is detailed for us. There's no question as to what it means. For example, look at verse 14 again of chapter 20. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second kind of death, the lake of fire. Hell. Now look at verse 8 of chapter 21. The latter part of that verse telling us, who shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second kind of death. Now, what did I tell you, you the word death means? What word? Separation. The first kind of death, physical death, is the separation of the real you, the real me, from the body. And when we separate from the body as believers, we go to be with the Lord. Now, the second kind of death is a separation. But it's the separation, the final separation, the banishment from the presence of God forever. That's the second kind of death, is the death of the unbeliever. To be separated from God for all eternity in the lake of fire. That's the second kind of death. Now, we have to go back to our text in 1 John and we ask ourselves, what kind of death is this? Is this the first kind of death, or is this the second kind of death? Well, I can assure you, dear people, that there will not be one saved person in the lake of fire. Not one. There will never be a born-again person in hell. Not one. So that the lake of fire, the second kind of death, is not the death mentioned in 1 John chapter 5. Now, at this point, let me just pass on some texts to enlarge upon the subject. There are two things in the Bible that are inseparably linked together. We can never disassociate. They are sin and death. For example, Genesis 2.17. God said to our first parents, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree which is in the midst of the garden thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely what? Sin and death, inseparably linked together. Ezekiel 18.4 The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Sin and death are inseparably linked together. Romans 5.12 Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. 
sin and death inseparably linked together. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is sin and death inseparably linked together. You can't disassociate them. James 1.15 Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now that principle is true in the lives of believers and unbelievers. It's a principle. It's an unchangeable law. Sin and death are inseparably linked together. So that it is possible that God may bring death to a believer, but it cannot be the second kind of death because there will not be one believer in hell. If one born-again person could ever be in hell, then the work of Jesus Christ on the cross was in vain, a total failure. And he didn't pay for our sins. Then the blood of Jesus Christ does not cleanse from all sin as the Bible says it does. There will be no children of God in hell. No way. Has it ever occurred to you that if a saved person could ever go to hell, the Holy Spirit will have to go to hell with him or her? Because the Lord Jesus promised in John 14 that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will abide with you forever. There is not a saved person, not one, who ever lost his or her salvation. Not one. We'll back that up with the Bible and with experience. Now don't come and say, but I know so-and-so who lost his salvation. You don't know anything of the kind. How do you know that so-and-so was ever saved? He said he was. Well, that didn't make it so. Don't point to someone else. Don't build up a straw man. You have sinned since you've been saved and you have never lost your salvation. Whatever else Hebrews chapter 6 verses 4, 5, and 6 are teaching, they're teaching this. If, it's a hypothetical if, if it were possible to lose it, it would be impossible to be resaved again. Now whatever else those verses are teaching, they're teaching that much. Okay? Now the, the death here cannot possibly be the lake of fire. There will not be one born again person in the lake of fire. Now, this is then the physical death of the body in 1 John 5.16. Now, how can I say this to bring it right down to earth so that you will not miss the point? This verse is teaching that there does come a time in the life of a believer who is sinning and will not stop sinning, a particular type of sin, let us say. A saved person continues in a particular type of sin. Now, it may not be something immoral, may not be adultery or murder or drunkenness. It could be lying. It could be cheating on your income tax. Lying. Definitely lying. Telling a lie. You know when you wrote it down you were lying. The Bible says you're not to lie. Do not bear false witness is just as important a commandment in the Decalogue as thou shalt not commit adultery. God doesn't classify our sins. Sin is sin. It's possible for a believer to continue practicing a sin. And God says, now look, I born with you long enough. You're no value to me on earth. Your constant sin brings disgrace to my name. You're better off dead than alive. And God steps in and separates the soul from the body. He brings physical death. Many years ago, the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, one of the great Bible teachers on the North American continent, wrote a little book. And I refer to this book a number of times in my ministry. It has never been reprinted. And I have my copy and I don't intend to part with it. Uh, it's entitled, Men Whom God Struck Dead. And Dr. Barnhouse went through the Bible and picked out all the Bible personalities, believers, whom God struck 
dead, and he expounded the reasons for their death. Everyone was a believer. And God stepped in and said, Now look, you're not being fair, you're not being honest. I've dealt with you in this sin. You've made efforts to stop it, but you continue in it, and you're hurting my cause, and it's better for me to take you home. We're going to look at some of the Bible personalities whom God struck dead. And every believer who dies, dies the first kind of death, the separation of the soul from the body, not the second kind of death. When the believer dies, he does not go to hell. Christ already paid for my sins, and God's not making two persons pay for the same sins. Jesus already paid for it. We sing the old gospel song, Jesus paid it all. Do you believe it? Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Do you believe that? If you don't, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Now, oh, by the way, before I go into this, look at verse 13 of chapter 5. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. Do you know, I believe that there are some people who are saved and they don't have the assurance of their salvation. I believe that's possible. They have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, they've trusted Him, but they have never studied their Bibles and they don't have the assurance. I have asked many people, are you saved? I, say, I hope so. Where are you going when you die? Well, I hope to heaven. And some of these people who give answers like that have been saved, but they don't have the assurance. Now, God wants us to be saved, but He wants us to know it. I know I'm saved. I don't deserve to be. Now, somebody said, boy, he sounds cocky. He knows. He. I only know I'm saved because of what the Bible tells me. I go by the Word. Assurance of salvation is a very important thing. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Now let me assume for a moment that for the most part, and I believe that this is not only possible but probable, for the most part I'm speaking to save people, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to look at some of the Bible personalities who fit into 1 John 5.16 people whom God struck dead. Turn with me, please, to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 48. And the Lord spake unto Moses. Was Moses a believer? Sure was. <clears throat> if, you, if you ever question that Moses was a believer, he appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration when our Lord was transfigured before the disciples, Peter, James, and John. Moses was there. And the Lord spake unto Moses that selfsame day, saying, Get thee up into this mountain Abarim, unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab that is over against Jericho, and behold the land of Canaan. Just stand there and on the mountain and, and look at it. My wife and I one day stood on that mount, and we looked out over the plains of Moab. And as we stood there, I said to Elsie, I said, Honey, what incident in the Bible comes to mind? She said, we are standing on the very spot where Moses stood when God killed him. It shook me up. I said to Elsie, honey, that's not the way I want to go. Moses was a man of... He wrote the first five books in the Bible. Read on. He said, and behold the land of Canaan. Get a good look at it. You're not going to go in. I'm not going to take you in. Which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession and die. Well, Lord, I'm not ready to die. Well, that's what you think. Die in the mount whither thou goest up and be gathered unto thy people as Aaron thy brother died in Mount Hor and was gathered unto his people. Now God's going to tell him why. He's going to separate his soul from his body. Because ye trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Mirabah Kadesh, 
in the wilderness of Zin, because you sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel. Do you know what one of Moses' sins that he repeated again? Moses was a man with an uncontrolled temper. He killed an Egyptian. Lost control, couldn't control his temper, killed an Egyptian. And it seemingly from the scripture without a weapon, he must have beat him to death with his bare hands. Do you remember the instant to which God refers here when God said to Moses, Now Moses, there's no water for the people. Just speak to the rock in my name, and I will bring forth water out of the rock. And Moses was just about fed up with the complaints of the people. And he took his rod and he beat on that rock. And he screamed at the rock and commanded water to come out of that rock. That's not what God told him to do lost control of himself. God said, Moses, you've been doing this, doing it, doing it. It's time. I'm going to take you away now. You've had it. And Moses got one look at the promised land as he stood on Mount Nebo, looked out over the plains of Moab, and he died there. Just dropped dead. God put him to death. There is a sin unto death. He didn't lose his salvation. Proof? He was there on the Mount of Transfiguration with our Lord. But God removed him off the scene and he lost some extra time whereby he could have served his Lord. His sin, which he did not forsake, terminated his earthly sojourn prematurely. There is a sin unto death. Turn to the book of Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Now Nadab and Abihu were the sons of Aaron, and they were prepared for the priesthood. They had finished a theological training. Their father was one of the leading priests. And uh, the boys were trained to follow in the footsteps coming from the same tribe. And uh, they're now entering into their public ministry. And we read verse 2 that there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. Now before these two young men got really started into their ministry, God killed them. It says in verse 1, they offered strange fire before the Lord. Now, what they did is not described here. There are several possibilities of the strange fire, and we haven't time to go into that. But let me just read on in the chapter. Will you go down now to verse uh, 8? Same context, hasn't changed. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink. Thou nor thy sons with thee when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. Whatever Nadab and Abihu did, obviously from the context they did it under the influence of alcoholic beverage. Instead of the spirit of God controlling them, they were controlled by an evil spirit, the demon of alcohol. And what they did, they never would have done if they were not under the influence of alcohol. So in the context, God tells us why these young men did what they did, and God killed them. Now, they had the possibility of a life of service for the Lord, coming from a godly family, trained in the right way, all ready to embark on a life of fruitful service and God stepped in and killed these two young men. And the context tells us why. You see, they were apparently doing some nipping and sipping on a regular basis. Now some folks say, well, I, I just do what the Bible says. I just take a little wine for my stomach's sake. And now when you read the Bible, you ask yourself some questions. Number one, who said it? Number two, to whom was it said? Paul didn't tell you to take a little wine for your stomach's sake. He told that to Timothy. You're not Timothy. Secondly, if you have some problem with your stomach, you are 2,000 years removed from Paul and Timothy with 2,000 years of medical know-how. 
You can get help. Come on. If you're taking the wine, it's not for your stomach's sake. You either like it or you're hooked on it. Can't get away from it. Either one of the two. Either you enjoy it or you're hooked on it. And if you enjoy it, it won't be long before you are hooked on it. God killed these two young men. Their behavior under the influence of liquor was anything but normal. It was subnormal, below normal, abnormal. That's why Ephesians 5.18 says, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't be controlled by alcohol. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit. I speak to young people sometimes, and I have good rapport with them. I have no axe to grind with our young people. Our young people are in a mess, but they didn't create the mess. The generations who preceded them created it. The generation of today inherited the mess. Don't hang it all on your young people. They didn't, in, they didn't cause it. They inherited it from you and your ancestors and me and my ancestors. And they need help, and many of them want help. And I've often said to groups of young people, I'll give you a written guarantee. I'll put it in writing under oath that you will never become a drunkard. Never. I'll guarantee it. I'll put it in writing. I'll sign my name to it. And they sit and listen. What does this man have? And I say it's very simple. Don't take the first drink. You got it licked. Can you imagine some young person taking his first glass of beer and say, Why are you doing that? Oh, I want to become a drunkard. Maybe I can kill somebody driving a car someday. Oh, come on. Uh, they have to follow somebody's bad judgment. Don't take the first drink. God killed these two young men. It happens repeatedly, dear people. Now, let's turn to another person in the Bible. Let's look at the book of Joshua. That follows the book of Deuteronomy. Joshua chapter 7. There's a man by the name of Achan who was walking down the rows between the tents in the camp and uh, one of the his neighbors left the flap open on his tent and as Achan walked by he looked into the tent and he saw <clears throat> his neighbor's sport jacket hanging up there and he saw a little box under the cot and he knew it was a strong box, a metal box, where they kept their personal things. So he looked one way and the other, and nobody was watching, so he went in. He tried on the jacket. It was a perfect 39, just fit him. And uh, he decided to take it. And then he looked under the cot and saw this little metal box, strong box, and he uh, pried it open and saw the man had his gold in there, so he stole the gold. And God killed him. He wasn't ready to die, but God killed him. Now, as you go through the Bible, you find that the reasons were all different. The reasons were all different. God struck him dead. He might have had a life of service. He could have been a blessing to people. He could have honored and glorified God. But a thief does not glorify God. A thief is not a blessing to other people. He's a bane, not a blessing. God killed him. There is a sin unto death. Then let's move into the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Acts. And find in the New Testament, Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. Now that was common. A lot of people were selling their possessions. If you look back at, at uh, verse 34 of the preceding chapter, neither was there anything among them that lacked. But as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and they laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution fellowship. In those days, if there were 
people who were suffering, some folks were willing to sell some things that they had, and fellowship with the suffering ones, with the needy ones. So it was common in those early days to fellowship in that way. Now, verse 5, a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And others are doing, we'll do it also. But he kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now what they did was to bring part of their money and pretend that they brought all. Now they could have given as much as they wanted. Nobody told them to give it all. Could have given as much as they wanted to give, but they didn't have to be phonies. They didn't have to pretend they were making a total sacrifice. And Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now we know that he lied because it says so. And Peter said, while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Ananias, when you do a thing like this, you're not sinning against man. All sin is against God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. He just dropped dead. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. They dealt with sin in those days. And the young men arose and wound him up. Now, in those days, when a person died, they wrapped the body in cloth. And they carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours when his wife, not knowing that her husband dropped dead, came in and Peter answered unto her. He said, tell me, did you sell the land for so much? And she said, yeah. And Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together, you and your husband, to tempt the Spirit of the Lord. Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out, and bingo, she fell down round dead. God a cruel God? No. God is a righteous God. God makes no mistakes. The judgments of God are always right. There is a sin unto death. The physical death of the body. 1 John 5.16 is talking about sinning saints who continue to sin. Now what should a believer do with his or her sins? Now look at verse 9 of chapter 1. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just. God is right. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What if I don't confess and forsake my sin? There is a sin unto death. Now, let us accept a solemn warning. Don't play God. Don't play God. Good and godly people have died young. Not everyone who dies young is being judged by God. And we are not qualified to take God's place and pass judgment as to the why. What we need to do, dear people, is to keep our confessions up to date. Make sure that God doesn't step in and say, you had it. You've been living in that sin, going to church, you've been a phony, You've had opportunity after opportunity, and you wouldn't confess and forsake the sin. As far as I'm concerned, you're better off dead than alive, and God just takes them home. Lost their reward. Lost their opportunity to serve the living God.